Welcome to Defenders, the teaching class of Dr. William Lane Craig. Today, The Existence of God, Part 21. For more information or resources, go to reasonablefaith.org. We've been talking about the moral argument for God's existence, and last time we looked at Plato's Euthyphro dilemma. Does God will something because it's good, or is something good because God wills it? And I suggested that's a false dilemma, that we don't need to pick either of those two horns, but rather the correct alternative is to say that God wills something because he is good. God's own nature is what Plato called the good, and his will expresses that toward us in the form of commandments which constitute our moral duties. Now the mention of Plato brings to mind another possible atheistic response to the first premise of the moral argument that if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Plato thought that the good just exists as a sort of self-subsistent idea, as an entity in and of itself. Indeed, it's the the most real uh, thing in, in reality. The good simply exists. Now, if you find this difficult to grasp, join the company. Uh, But nevertheless, that is what Plato believed. Later Christian thinkers, like Augustine, equated Plato's good with the nature of God. God's nature is the good, and so it was anchored in a concrete object, namely God. But for Plato, at least, the good just sort of existed on its own as a kind of self-existent idea. And so, some atheists might say that moral values like justice, mercy, love, forbearance, just exist all on their own as sort of abstract moral objects or values. They have no other foundation. They just exist. And we can call this view atheistic moral Platonism. So according to this view, moral values are not grounded in God. They just exist all on their own. Now, what might we say by way of response to atheistic moral Platonism? Well, let me make three responses. Number one, it seems to me that this view is just unintelligible. Uh, I simply don't understand what it means. What does it mean, for example, to say that the moral value, justice, just exists? I understand what it means to say that a person is just, or that some action is just, But what does it even mean to say that in the absence of any persons or any objects at all, that justice just exists? It's hard to understand even what this means. Moral values seem to be properties of persons. And so it's hard to understand how justice can just exist as a sort of abstraction. Secondly, A major weakness of this view is that it provides no basis for objective moral duties. It has no basis for moral duties. Let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that moral values like justice, love, forbearance, tolerance, just exist uh, on their own. Why would that lay any sort of moral obligation upon me? Why would the existence of this realm of ideas make it my duty to be, say, merciful or loving. Who or what lays such an obligation upon me? Why would I have the moral duty to be merciful or loving? Notice that on this view, moral vices like greed, hatred, selfishness presumably also exist as abstractions. So in the absence of any moral lawgiver, what obligates me to align my life with one set of these abstract ideas rather than with some other set of abstract ideas. There just doesn't seem to be any basis at all for moral duty in this view. So, in the absence of a moral lawgiver, atheistic moral Platonism lacks any basis for moral obligation. Finally, number three, it is fantastically improbable that the blind evolutionary process should spit forth exactly those kinds of creatures that align with the existence of this realm of abstract values. Remember, they have no relationship with each other at all. 
the natural realm and this abstract moral realm are completely separate. And yet, lo and behold, the natural realm has by chance alone evolved exactly those kind of creatures whose lives align with these moral duties and values. This seems to be an incredible coincidence when you think about it. It's almost as if the moral realm knew that we were coming. And I think it's a far more plausible view to say that both the natural realm and the moral realm are under the sovereignty of a divine being who is both the creator of natural laws that govern the physical universe and whose commands constitute the moral laws that govern our ethical duties. So this is a more coherent view of reality. Theism is a more coherent view because these two realms of reality don't fall apart in this disjointed way. They are both under the sovereignty of a single natural and moral law giver. So for those three reasons, I think that atheistic moral Platonism is a less plausible view than uh, theistic-based ethics, such as I've been defending. Any comment or question on atheistic moral Platonism? Okay, we'll get the mic down here for Cindy. I'm sorry if I missed this, something you said earlier. Um, most of my acquaintances who are atheistic look at it as not being abstract, but evolved with the human race and, and not outside of it. So while it, it is, it's not subject to any individual, but what has evolved with the human race is a common understanding of morals mm -hmm. because as in the physical evolution, the moral evolution has risen to the top to be the best way for the species to um, progress, such as not murdering, yeah. uh, not stealing, and all of those things. I mean, if you want to put it that simplistically. But um, I, I don't know many that would argue there is this, this uh, external moral value at all. It's only within the evolutionary, physical as evolutionary process. This view is very different from the view you right. just described. You're right. On the popular level, you're not going to find many people who hold to this kind of atheistic moral Platonism. I think this would be more popular among academics, uh, professional philosophers, I think, would often hold to something like this. But the man in the street is more apt to buy into the view that moral values are just the product of biological and social evolution. And what I would argue, as I said last week, is that actually supports premise one, because those really aren't moral values. What those are are simply um, conditions under which the human species will flourish. But there's no reason to think that that species has any sort of intrinsic value more than mice or rats or ants. And there are certain uh, values which would cause ants to flourish, say. Or if you want to have mice flourish, there would be certain things that ought to be done to cause those species to flourish. And to think that human flourishing is somehow morally special, as I said, is to be guilty of speciesism, which is an unjustified bias in favor of your own species. And so what you need to do is simply ask those folks, why is what you're describing not just a reiteration of the view that I'm maintaining, namely that in the absence of God, all you've described is the conditions under which this particular species will flourish and survive. But that doesn't mean that they're intrinsically morally valuable or that we have any obligation to make this species survive or flourish. Uh, the, the sociopath who rejects the herd morality isn't really doing anything wrong, it seems to me, on this view. Another thing you might say in response to that view is that if you were to rewind the film of evolution, like a movie, and start over again, a very different sort of creature might have emerged from the evolutionary process with a quite different set of moral values. And if that's the case, then who's are right? theirs or, or ours? Well, I think the answer is neither one. These are just the byproducts of evolutionary development. And you can't say that these other beings' morality is inferior to ours or that ours is better than theirs. There isn't any objective truth about these things. So it seems to me that that popular view is one that we can exploit in the defense of premise one. 
By contrast, atheistic moral Platonism really is a rejection of premise one. It's saying that these things, these moral values and duties just exist without any sort of basis in God. Question way back there. I appreciate it. I know I've been on one already. <laughs> in support of what you're saying, you know, I see when I read that in, in scientific journals even that, they, uh, that people that hold this popular view, they will apply an emotive or volitional quality to evolution, which is contradictory to the to the process. Nothing can be evolved in anticipation of some no. future condition or good. Purely accidental. So, that, so this is self-contradictory to say that, that they knew this was going to be good, so that's what happened. This is right. circular Right. No, that, that would be untenable. And that kind of anthropomorphizing of natural selection, speaking of natural selection as though it had purposes in mind or things to achieve is a, is a misleading way of talking. Oh, yes. Okay. Jim? Just uh, does it change versus the discussion over here about evolving values? Does it change if you use the word absolute? Absolute, how, absolute objective moral values? Well, I, pre, I, I don't think so, Jim, because I've avoided the word absolute in my defense of this because I'm not defending the view that there are absolute moral values in the sense of moral values or duties that are universally applicable regardless of one's situation. What I'm saying is that there are objective moral values, objective moral truths, even if these differ from situation to situation. So for example, in some situations, it would be wrong to put a bullet into somebody's head. Um, but in other situations, say a terrorist attack, it would be right to put a bullet in his head to protect innocent people. So in the one case, uh, the action would be objectively good, in the other case it would be objectively bad. So my concern here is with objective moral values as opposed to moral absolutes. I think there are probably some moral absolutes. For example, you shall love the Lord your God with all your strength, heart, and mind. I think that holds regardless of situation. But that's neither here nor there with regard to this argument. All right, I think in the interest of time, I want to keep moving and go on to the next a uh, possible objection to premise one, which is what I call stubborn humanism. Stubborn humanism. The atheist generally wants to affirm objective moral values and duties. He wants to affirm that human beings are morally valuable, that his children, for example, are morally valuable, and that it's good to love them. And so most of them will simply embrace a kind of humanism and just stop there. Uh, whatever contributes to human flourishing is good, and whatever detracts from human flourishing is bad, and that's the end of the story. You just stick with humanism. But it seems to me that taking human flourishing as your ultimate stopping point is premature. It seems to me a premature stopping point. And I say that because of two factors. First, it's arbitrariness, and secondly, it's implausibility. It's arbitrariness and implausibility as a stopping point. Let me say first a word about its arbitrariness. Given atheism, why think that what is conducive to the flourishing of human beings on this planet uh, is valuable, as opposed to what is conducive to the flourishing of, say, mosquitoes or rats? Why think that inflicting harm on another member of our species is morally wrong. I put this question once to Walter Sinnott Armstrong in a debate I had with him at Dartmouth College, and uh, when I asked him why is it wrong to harm another member of our species, his answer was this, and I quote, it simply is, objectively. Don't you agree? Well, of course I agree that it is wrong to hurt another human being, but that wasn't the question. The question is, Given atheism, why would it be wrong to hurt another human being? Given an atheistic worldview, picking out human flourishing as the good is arbitrary, it seems to me. There's nothing morally special about human beings on a naturalistic worldview. Secondly, it also seems to me implausible. Not only is it arbitrary, but it's implausible. What atheists will sometimes say is that 
once the natural or physical properties of a situation are in place, then the moral properties just automatically necessarily attach themselves to that physical situation. Uh, and the technical term that is used for this is supervene. Supervene. Once you fix the natural physical properties of a situation, then the moral properties come along and supervene on that situation or attach themselves necessarily to it. So, for example, take the situation of a man beating up his wife. Once the physical properties are there of him bludgeoning her and her being beaten and so forth, then the moral property of badness just necessarily attaches to that situation. Or, by contrast, take a mother nursing her little infant. Once the physical properties are in place for that to be the case, then the moral property of goodness just necessarily attaches or supervenes on that situation. So that atheists will say that once all the natural properties are in place, the moral properties just automatically come along and supervene on the situation. Now, it seems to me that on atheism, this is extraordinarily implausible. Given atheism, why think that these strange, non-natural properties like goodness and badness even exist? Much less that they somehow magically attach themselves necessarily to these physical situations. Why in the world would these things come along and supervene on these natural properties? I can't see any reason on atheism to think that given a full description of the physical situation that any moral properties at all would come along and attach themselves to this situation so that the physical properties would do nothing to fix or determine any of the moral properties of that situation. So that it's just really implausible, it seems to me, given atheism, to think that this happens. What these humanistic philosophers have done is they've adopted what's called a shopping list approach to ethics. A shopping list approach. Just as uh, you would go to the grocery store with your shopping list and just help yourself to the things on the shelf that you want, so these philosophers go down the philosophical aisle with their shopping carts and they just help themselves to the moral properties that they need in order for their ethical system to work. But what's wanting here is any sort of explanation or justification for thinking that uh, situations would have these uh, moral properties attaching to them. And again, I want to emphasize it's inadequate for the humanist to say that we just do sense that these situations are good or that they're bad. That, that's not in dispute. In fact, that's the second premise of the argument, that there are objective moral values and duties. Rather, the question is, why on atheism should we think that, moral, or that human beings are morally significant or that they have any moral duties? It seems to me that humanism is nothing more than a stubborn moral faith in a naturalistic universe. Joe. I'm reminded of the, I think it was a female professor you debated that said, asked you if you had any friends after you said that. Why yeah, that was Louise have... Antony at the University of Massachusetts <laughs> where she said uh, that don't you dare tell me that on my atheistic view uh, that my children have no moral value because you'll find I can be very, you, you know, strong or aggressive or forget exact words. And I, I said to her, but Louise, I said, on atheism, I said, I can't see any reason to think that your children have any moral value. And she looked at me and she just says, I wonder if you have any friends. <laughs> And that was all the reputation that she could offer. Devastating rebuttal. Hey, uh, yeah. super, the supervenience thing I was going to ask you, yeah. do you ever exploit the fact that they're, being, they're affirming an immaterial entity by saying these properties or something attached, or is that too much of a... I, I don't, Joe, though my colleague J.P. Moreland right. likes to. Notice that in appealing to things like atheistic moral Platonism or talking about these non-natural properties... The atheist has moved away from a materialistic view of the world. He's admitting now that there are non-physical, immaterial realities like values or properties 
And that is a move away from a kind of hard-nosed naturalism. Now, I don't exploit that view, I guess, because I think that so many naturalists are quite ready to say that there are non-physical realities. That may surprise you, but actually that, that's true. Uh, a great many naturalists today are not physicalists or materialists. They think there are non-material realities. So that kind of softens the ground for thinking that maybe there could be a non-physical reality like God. But I don't exploit that, but you're quite right. It is, it is a move away from a hard-line, naturalistic, materialistic view of, of what exists. Yes? So in the supervening, does you say the uh, um, moral properties attach themselves after the natural properties are fixed? Not in a Not chronological okay. sense, I was but about they're, to say, they're explanatorily okay. uh, secondary. Okay, yeah, because I, I would say chronologically, that seemed like that'd be a worthless morality. It's like, you know, the physical yeah. nature is fixed. Well, I need the moral properties to atta have already attach themselves before I start fixing these <laughs> physical properties that get me in do, trouble. Yeah. No, no, when I say after here, I don't mean in a chronological sense. It's more like the foundation is the physical properties, and then... What lies on top of them are the moral properties, but these would be simultaneous. But one would be more basic than the other. I think you get the idea, right, even though they're simultaneous. One is uh, after it in the sense that it's, it's the, the other one is the foundation and the moral properties are, are on top of that in a sense. But it's still, to me, on naturalism, a very odd view to think that when these primate animals called human beings say nurse their children that here are these moral properties that somehow accrue to this situation i just can't see any reason to think that that would happen given atheism any other comments yeah joe again you find the kin altruism response to be the most common the sort of evolutionary sociobiological explanation to be the most common among naturalists when trying to what we discussed earlier, do you find it to be the most common in debates and in, in well, your interaction? Well, not in my debates. As I'll say, Joe, when I come to the second premise, very, very few of the atheist philosophers I've debated take this kind of hard-nosed evolutionary line that Cindy was describing a moment ago. Most of them will be more atheistic moral Platonists. They'll want to affirm that there are objective moral values and objective moral duties that we have and that these are not just the spin-offs of social, social and biological evolution. What Joe was talking about was that moral values and duties might be explained as illusions that arise in us because of our kinship to other genetically similar organisms and the, the selfish gene, so to speak, in order to survive has individuals do sacrificial acts that will hurt the individual, but it will be good for the propagation of the, the species. And as I say, you can see that even among ants. In an ant heap, there are soldier ants which will give up their lives for the sake of the ant heap because instinct is programmed it into these ants to perish fighting for the queen or for the, the ant heap. But it's not because they do this out of moral duty or, or anything of that sort. They don't do anything praiseworthy. It's just blind evolutionary instinct that has built this into these ants because that will make the ant species survive if some of the soldier ants are willing to give up their lives for the ant heap. And that's all moral values are among human beings as well. They're just illusions inculcated into us by natural selection and parental conditioning and societal conditioning to get us to perform in, base, in various ways that will be conducive to the survival of, of the human species. Uh, and that's, it seems to me, that's all they are on an atheistic view. Uh, and that is why I think premise one is true. Yes, uh, Bob? Bill, you remember these 1950s and 1960s science fiction films where an alien species would come and say, we've been watching you and we've put up to you with, with you until this time, but you have now have, have set off a nuclear weapon. The chances of you metastasizing to other areas of the universe is much greater, and you must be stopped. Now, let me tell you something. For, to me, that's a perfectly reasonable view, because as I look, humanists, of course, I guess would, would argue quite differently, but if you take God out of the picture, 
I don't see that mankind is any great bargain. War has just been, I mean, it's just yeah. awful. And it is, whether there are other, other life in the universe or not, how can you stand as a humanist and as an atheist and say, this is good because it advances mankind. Well, yeah. first, you've got to prove that advancing mankind is good first. Right. I don't see any evidence of that. Yeah. Bob, this is an excellent illustration. It parallels the illustration I gave to Cindy where I said, rewind the film of evolution, start over again, and a very different creature might evolve with different values and, and duties. The other illustration is Bob's extraterrestrial intelligent life who comes to Earth with an utterly different set of moral values or significantly different set of moral values. Who would be right, us or them? And there isn't any objective way to decide. Michael Roos, who is an agnostic philosopher of science and evolutionist, has written a wonderful article called Is Rape Wrong on Andromeda? Is Rape Wrong on Andromeda? And he says and argues in this essay that there's no guarantee that a race of intelligent beings from, say, the galaxy Andromeda might think that rape is not a good thing and that in that race of beings, rape would be regarded as perfectly morally all right. Well, in my debate that I had with Michael Roos, I quoted his own article and I said, Michael, what would you say if these beings came to the earth and they decided to go throughout the earth raping and, and killing? And maybe they're more advanced than us comparable to the way we're advanced to, say, cattle and sheep, and they begin to farm the earth and use us for food. What, what would we say as to why this would be wrong, that this is wrong for us? Well, the aliens, as Bob said, would say, well, that's just a product of your evolutionary conditioning. There's no reason we should think that it's wrong to eat you or to rape throughout the earth. And so I think this extraterrestrial illustration is a very powerful illustration that in the absence of God, human morality isn't objective. Um, it, it, it has no more claim to be objective than some extraterrestrial alien morality. Well, that completes my defense of premise one, which brings us then to our second premise, that objective moral values and duties do exist. Now, I initially thought that this would be the really controversial premise uh, in the argument. But as I say, what I found in my debates with atheist philosophers is that almost nobody disputes this second premise. In fact, surveys actually show that university faculty, university professors, are less relativistic than students. They're more apt to believe in objective moral values and duties than the students do, and that of the faculty, the branch that believes most in objective moral values and duties are the philosophers. So the philosophers, whose job it is to reflect about ethics and so forth, are the ones most apt to believe in objective moral values and duties, more so than the rest of the faculty, and the faculty believe in them more so than do the students. So it's really quite a wrong impression to think that it's in the university faculties that all of this relativism is being propagated. It's more common among the students. So when we meet next time, what we'll do is look at what justification exists for premise two. Why is it that even most non-Christian, non-theistic philosophers believe that objective moral values and duties exist? That's what we'll look at next time. The copyright for the content of this recording is held by Dr. William Lane Craig. For more, go to reasonablefaith.org.